Section 3 of Three Years in Europe, or Places I Have Seen and People I Have Met. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White. Three Years in Europe, or Places I Have Seen and People I Have Met, by William Wells Brown. Letter 3. Departure from Ireland. London. Trip to Paris. Paris. The Peace Congress, first day. Church of the Madeleine. Column Van Dome. The French. Paris, August 23. After a pleasant sojourn of three weeks in Ireland, I took passage in one of the mail steamers for Liverpool, and arriving there was soon on the road to the metropolis. The passage from Dublin to Liverpool was an agreeable one. The rough sea that we passed through on going to Ireland had given way to a dead calm, and our noble little steamer, on quitting the Dublin wharf, seemed to understand that she was to have it all her own way. During the first part of the evening, the boat appeared to feel her importance, and, darting through the water with majestic strides, she left behind her a dark cloud of smoke, suspended in the air like a banner, while far astern in the wake of the vessel could be seen the rippled waves sparkling in the rays of the moon, giving strength and beauty to the splendor of the evening. On reaching Liverpool, and partaking of a good breakfast, for which we paid double price, we proceeded to the railway station, and were soon going at a rate unknown to those accustomed to travel on one of our American railways. At a little past two o'clock in the afternoon, we saw in the distance the outskirts of London. We could get but an indistinct view, which had the appearance of one architectural mass extending all round to the horizon, and enveloped in a combination of fog and smoke. And towering above every other object to be seen was the dome of St. Paul's Cathedral. A few moments more, and we were safely seated in a handsome's patent, and on our way to Hughes's, one of the politest men of the George Fox stamp we have ever met. Here we found forty or fifty persons who, like ourselves, were bound for the Peace Congress. The Sturges, the Wighams, the Richardsons, the Allens, the Thomases, and a host of others not less distinguished as friends of peace were of the company, many of whom I had heard of, but none of whom I had ever seen. Yet I was not an entire stranger to many, especially to the abolitionists. In company with a friend, I sallied forth after tea to take a view of the city. The evening was fine. The dense fog and smoke having to some extent passed away left the stars shining brightly, while the gaslight from the street lamps and the brilliant shop windows gave it the appearance of daylight in a new form. "'What street is this?' we asked. "'Cheapside,' was the reply. The street was thronged, and everybody seemed to be going at a rapid rate, as if there was something of importance at the end of the journey. Flying vehicles of every description passing each other with a dangerous rapidity, men with lovely women at their sides, children running about as if they had lost their parents, all gave a brilliancy to the scene scarcely to be excelled. If one wished to get jammed and pushed about, he need go no farther than Cheapside. But everything of the kind is done with a degree of propriety in London that would put the New Yorkers to blush. If you are run over in London, they beg your pardon. If they run over you in New York, you are laughed at. In London, if your hat is knocked off, it is picked up and handed to you. If in New York, you must pick it up yourself. There is a lack of good manners among Americans that is scarcely known or understood in Europe. Our stay in the great metropolis gave us but little opportunity of seeing much of the place, 
for in twenty-four hours after our arrival we joined the rest of the delegates and started on our visit to our Gaelic neighbors. We assembled at the London Bridge Railway Station on Tuesday morning, the 21st, a few minutes past nine, to the number of six hundred. The day was fine, and every eye seemed to glow with enthusiasm. Besides the delegates, there were probably not less than six hundred more who had come to see the company start. We took our seats, and appeared to be waiting for nothing but the iron horse to be fastened to the train, when, all at once, we were informed that we must go to the booking office and change our tickets. At this news, everyone appeared to be vexed. This caused great trouble, for on returning to the train many persons got into the wrong carriages, and several parties were separated from their friends, while not a few were calling out at the top of their voices, where is my wife? Where is my husband? Where is my luggage? Who's got my boy? Is this the right train? What is that lady going to do with all these children? asked the guard. Is she a delegate? Are all the children delegates? In the carriage where I had taken my seat was a good-looking lady who gave signs of being very much annoyed. "'It is just so when I am going anywhere. "'I never saw the like in my life,' said she. "'I really wish I was at home again.' "'An hour had now elapsed, and we were still at the station. "'However, we were soon on our way, and going at express speed. "'In passing through Kent, we enjoyed the scenery exceedingly, "'as the weather was altogether in our favour, "'and the drapery which nature hung on the trees— in the part through which we passed, was in all its gaiety. On our arrival at Folkestone, we found three steamers in readiness to convey the party to Boulogne. As soon as the train stopped, a general rush was made for the steamers, and in a very short time the one in which I had embarked was passing out of the harbour. The boat appeared to be conscious that we were going on a holy mission, and seemed to be proud of her load. There is nothing in this wide world so like a thing of life as a steamer, from the breathing of her steam and smoke, the energy of her motion, and the beauty of her shape, while the ease with which she is managed by the command of a single voice makes her appear as obedient as the horse is to the rein. When we were about halfway between the two great European powers, the officers began to gather the tickets. The first to whom he applied, and who handed out his excursion ticket, was informed that we were all in the wrong boat. "'Is this not one of the boats to take over the delegates?' asked a pretty little lady with a whining voice. "'No, madam,' said the captain. "'You must look to the committee for your pay,' said one of the company to the captain. "'I have nothing to do with committees,' the captain replied. "'Your fair, gentlemen, if you please.' Here the whole party were again thrown into confusion. "'Do you hear that? We are in the wrong boat. "'I knew it would be so,' said the Reverend Dr. Ritchie of Edinburgh. "'It is indeed a pretty piece of work,' said a plain-looking lady in a handsome bonnet. "'When I go travelling again,' said an elderly-looking gent with an eyeglass to his face, "'I will take the Phaeton and old Dobbin.' Everyone seemed to lay the blame on the committee, and not, too, without some grounds. However, Mr. Sturge, one of the committee, being in the boat with us, an arrangement was entered into, by which we were not compelled to pay our fare the second time. As we neared the French coast, the first object that attracted our attention was the Napoleon Pillar, on the top of which is a statue of the Emperor in the imperial robes. We landed, partook of refreshment that had been prepared for us, and again repaired to the railway station. The arrangements for leaving Boulogne were no better than those at London, but after the delay of another hour we were again in motion. It was a beautiful country through which we passed from Boulogne to Amiens, 
straggling cottages which bespeak neatness and comfort abound on every side the eye wanders over the diversified views with unabated pleasure and rests in calm repose upon its superlative beauty indeed the eye cannot but be gratified at viewing the entire country from the coast to the metropolis sparkling hamlets spring up as the steam horse speeds his way at almost every point showing the progress of civilization and the refinement of the nineteenth century we arrived at paris a few minutes past twelve o'clock at night when according to our tickets we should have been there at nine elihu burett who had been in paris some days and who had the arrangements pretty much his own way was at the station waiting the arrival of the train and we had demonstrated to us the best evidence that he understood his business in no other place on the whole route had the affairs been so well managed for we were seated in our respective carriages and our luggage placed on the top and away we went to our hotels without the least difficulty or inconvenience the champion of an ocean penny postage received as he deserved thanks from the whole company for his admirable management the silence of the night was only disturbed by the rolling of the wheels of the omnibus as we passed through the dimly lighted streets where a few months before was to be seen the flash from the cannon and the musket and the hearing of the cries and groans behind the barricades was now the stillness of death nothing save here and there a gendarme was to be seen going his rounds in silence the omnibus set us down at the hotel bedford rue de Lorraine, where although near one o'clock we found a good supper waiting for us and as i was not devoid of an appetite i did my share towards putting it out of the way the next morning i was up at an early hour and out on the boulevards to see what might be seen as i was passing from the bedford to the place de la concorde all at once and as if by some magic power i found myself in front of the most splendid edifice imaginable situated at the end of the rue nationale seeing a number of persons entering the church at that early hour and recognizing among them my friend the president of the oberlin ohio institute and wishing not to stray too far from my hotel before breakfast i followed the crowd and entered the building the church itself consisted of a vast nave interrupted by four pews on each side fronted with lofty fluted corinthian columns standing on pedestals supporting colossal arches bearing up cupolas pierced with skylights and adorned with compartments gorgeously gilt their corners supported with saints and apostles in alto relievo the walls of the church were lined with rich marble the different paintings and figures gave the interior an imposing appearance on inquiry i found that i was in the church of the madeleine it was near this spot that some of the most interesting scenes occurred during the revolution of eighteen forty eight which dethroned louis philippe behind the madeleine is a small but well supplied market and on an esplanade east of the edifice a flower market is held on tuesdays and fridays the first session of the peace congress is over the congress met this morning at eleven o'clock in the salle saint cecile rue de la saint lazare the parisians have no exeter hall in fact there is no private hall in the city of any size save this where such a meeting could be held this hall has been fitted up for the occasion the room is long and at one end has a raised platform and at the opposite end is a gallery with seats raised one above another on one side of the hall was a balcony with sofas which were evidently the reserve seats the hall was filled at an early hour with the delegates their friends and a good sprinkling of the french 
Occasionally, small groups of gentlemen would make their appearance on the platform, until it soon appeared that there was little room left for others, and yet the officers of the convention had not come in. The different countries were, many of them, represented here. England, France, Belgium, Germany, Switzerland, Greece, Spain, and the United States had each their delegates. The assembly began to give signs of impatience when very soon the train of officials made their appearance amid great applause. Victor Hugo led the way, followed by Monsieur Duguerey, curé of the Madeleine, Elihu Burett, and a host of others of less note. Victor Hugo took the chair as president of the Congress, supported by vice-presidents from the several nations represented. Mr. Richard, the secretary, read a dry report of the names of societies, committees, etc., which was deemed the opening of the convention. The president then arose and delivered one of the most impressive and eloquent appeals in favor of peace that could possibly be imagined. The effect produced upon the minds of all present was such as to make the author of Notre Dame de Paris a great favorite with the Congress. An English gentleman near me said to his friend, I can't understand a word of what he says, but is it not good? Victor Hugo concluded his speech amid the greatest enthusiasm on the part of the French, which was followed by hurrahs in the old English style. The convention was successively addressed by the President of the Brussels Peace Society, President Mahon of the Oberlin, Ohio Institute, U.S., Henry Vincent, and Richard Cobden. The latter was not only the lion of the English delegation, but the great man of the convention. When Mr. Cobden speaks, there is no want of hearers. The great power of this gentleman lies in his facts and his earnestness, for he cannot be called an eloquent speaker. Mr. Cobden addressed the Congress first in French, then in English, and, with the single exception of Mr. Ewart, M.P., was the only one of the English delegation that could speak to the French in their own language. The Congress was brought to a close at five o'clock when the numerous audience dispersed, the citizens to their homes, and the delegates to see the sights. I was not a little amused at an incident that occurred at the close of the first session. On the passage from America, there were, in the same steamer with me, several Americans, and among these three or four appeared to be much annoyed at the fact that I was a passenger, and enjoying the company of white persons. And although I was not openly insulted, I very often heard the remark that, "'That nigger had better be on his master's farm,' and what could the american peace society be thinking about to send a black man as a delegate to paris well at the close of the first sitting of the convention and just as i was leaving victor hugo to whom i had been introduced by an m p i observed near me a gentleman with his hat in hand whom i recognized as one of the passengers who had crossed the atlantic with me in the canada and who appeared to be the most horrified at having a negro for a fellow passenger. This gentleman, as I left Monsieur Hugo, stepped up to me and said, How do you do, Mr. Brown? You have the advantage of me, said I. Oh, don't you know me? I was a fellow passenger with you from America. I wish you would give me an introduction to Victor Hugo and Mr. Cobden. I need not inform you that I declined introducing this pro-slavery American to these distinguished men. I only allude to this to show what a change comes over the dreams of my white American brother by crossing the ocean. The man who would not have been seen walking with me in the streets of New York, and who would not have shaken hands with me with a pair of tongs while on the passage from the United States, could come with hat in hand in Paris and say, I was your fellow passenger. From the Salle de Saint-Cécile, 
I visited the Column Vendome, from the top of which I obtained a fine view of Paris and its environs. This is the Bunker Hill Monument of Paris. On the top of this pillar is a statue of the Emperor Napoleon, eleven feet high. The monument is built with stone, and the outside covered with a metallic composition made of cannons, guns, spikes, and other warlike implements taken from the Russians and Austrians by Napoleon. Above twelve hundred cannons were melted down to help create this monument of folly to commemorate the success of the French arms in the German campaign. The column is an imitation of the Trajan pillar at Rome and is twelve feet in diameter at the base. The door at the bottom of the pillar and where we entered was decorated above with crowns of oak surmounted by eagles, each weighing five hundred pounds. The bas relief of the shaft pursues a spiral direction to the capital and displays, in a chronological order, the principal actions of the French army, from the departure of the troops from Boulogne to the Battle of Austerlitz. The figures are near three feet high, and their number said to be two thousand. This sumptuous monument stands on a plinth of polished granite, surmounted by an iron railing and from its size and position has an imposing appearance when seen from any part of the city. Everything here appears strange and peculiar, the people not less so than their speech. The horses, carriages, furniture, dress, and manners are in keeping with their language. The appearance of the laborers in caps resembling nightcaps seemed particularly strange to me, the women without bonnets and their caps turned the right side behind had nothing of the look of our American women. The prettiest woman I ever saw was without a bonnet, walking on the boulevards. While in Ireland, and during the few days I was in England, I was struck with the marked difference between the appearance of the women from those of my own country. The American women are too tall, too sallow, and too long-featured to be called pretty. This is most probably owing to the fact that in America the people come to maturity earlier than in most other countries. My first night in Paris was spent with interest. No place can present greater street attractions than the boulevards of Paris. The countless number of cafés with tables before the doors and these surrounded by men with long moustaches, with ladies at their sides whose very smiles give indication of happiness, together with the sound of music from the gardens in the rear, tell the stranger that he is in a different country from his own. End of Letter 3 Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista